All right, so our agenda, we have quite a few things to cover today. Uh, we're going to start by talking about the foundational structure of an argument. Then we'll go into three different rhetorical appeals before transitioning into sort of the nuts and bolts of how to develop a counter argument. I'm going to then share three specific argumentative writing methods with you, and then we'll transition over to the live demo of Invivo and Satavi with Stacey, Stacey and Laura. So I just want to um, remind you of a few things. So if you have questions while I'm presenting, if something comes up, please enter it into the Q&A, not the chat. It'll probably get lost in the chat. So enter your questions in the Q&A, and then at the end, I will answer as many questions as I can. And then I'm going to go over into um, the exhibitor hall, into the dissertation by design exhibitor hall booth. Um, if you feel like you have some follow-up questions for me, I'll be happy to answer those for in real time on Zoom. So we're going to get started with a poll. I think it's always just sort of interesting to learn about um, those of you who are here watching. I'd like to know how confident you are in your ability to develop um, a strong and compelling argument. Stacey is launching that poll for me to so just fill that in. Oh, got a few highly confident writers. Mm -hmm. Most of you, as expected, are fairly confident. I see that response the most, I think. Good, Stacey's sharing those results. So a few of you are highly confident, seven of you. 24% uh, confident, 51% fairly confident, and then 22% not confident. And so obviously this is not a long presentation. Um, I'm not going to teach you everything you need to know about building an argument, but I am going to give you the high level overview. And so I hope that by sharing this information, those of you in the not confident and the fairly confident category will at least feel more able to go out and evaluate your own writing to see maybe where these um, different sort of characteristics of strong argumentation might be lacking in your writing. Uh, I'm also going to share resources with you so that you can take a deeper dive into the argumentative methods that I'm going to share with you today um, and perhaps take an opportunity to learn more about the sort of art of developing a compelling argument. So. This might seem a little elementary, but I, I think it's important to just be really clear here. What is an argument? What are we talking about? I think the term argument tends to elicit sort of images of like a heated disagreement, but as many of you likely know, that that's not what I'm referring to here in the sense of writing. It's just really a set of premises that logically lead to a conclusion. And so this idea of logic and reasoning is very important to keep in mind when you're developing an argument. And an argument isn't always persuasive, um, but I, I do believe that argumentation is important for uh, research writing. It can be important for technical writing. It really just depends on the audience and the purpose of the technical report. Um, but really, the, I was actually talking to a colleague of mine who just had a, an article accepted to be published in a peer-reviewed journal. And she was sharing her the feedback from the reviewers with me because she knew I was doing this presentation today. And the reviewers all commented on the strength of her argument. And it just reminded me of how often, as a reviewer, I provide feedback on maybe where the argument is weak or maybe where there's sort of gaps in logic in the writer's argumentation. Um, and so I think sharpening your argumentation skills uh, is an important skill to develop and it's something that you should focus on and it takes time. So I don't think any of us just start writing immediately and we are able to immediately document a strong and compelling argument. Um, I've certainly learned quite a bit over time through not just writing, but reading the work of others. So if you can participate in peer review, I think that that's a great way to see how others um, are demonstrating argumentation in their writing. So these are some common challenges that I hear about from folks who are maybe struggling with this aspect of building an argument. Maybe you're not familiar with argumentative writing conventions. Maybe it's been a while since you took a writing class. Maybe you're a non-traditional student. Um, maybe you're new to your research topic and you don't fully understand it yet. So as you can imagine, when I talk about counter arguments today, 
it would be hard to develop a counter argument if you're new to a topic and you're not yet familiar with all of the literature on that topic. Maybe you're rushing the writing process. Maybe you're not taking the time to really think critically about the claims you're making and how you're supporting those claims with evidence. Maybe you haven't fully developed your analytical skills. I find that in this category, when I say weak critical thinking or analytical skills, what that typically translates to is someone rushing the process, not taking the time to critically think and analyze uh, what they're reading. And then inadequate use of evidence. This could be in the form of like broad sweeping statements that are not, are not justified by the evidence, um, or it could be, you know, not using any evidence at all, not using evidence correctly. You know, this could show up in a number of ways. But these are the common challenges that I hear about most frequently. And so I'm going to just touch on these three rhetorical appeals. And I have an article here um, that you'll be able to access um, when you get the PDF of this. But the three rhetorical appeals are logos, ethos, and pathos. So when you're building an argument, you want to make sure that your argument contains these different rhetorical appeals. And there are many different rhetorical devices that you can use in order to sort of strengthen these rhetorical appeals. I'm not going to have time to go into those today, um, but I just wanted to point that out. So when we talk about logos, that's just the quality of the reasoning. Does the evidence support the claim? I'm going to show you some examples of that today. Ethos is simply the credibility and veracity of the reasoning. Does the reader, when they're looking at your argument, do they believe it? So is it credible? And is it true? That's the veracity. And then pathos is just the appeal to emotions. Does the argument evoke emotions? And no, this does not mean that your writing is highly emotional or unfounded, um, but there's usually some sort of emotional appeal uh, when you're trying to argue for or against something. So we're going to look at some examples of these. So here's an example. This is a screenshot of a table taken from this article by Pearson et al. on argumentation across the disciplines. And uh, Pearson and colleagues did a great job of sort of breaking down the appeal that I just talked about, highlighting the emphasis, and then providing an example. Um, so logo, the quality of the reasoning, an example would be the correlation between increased carbon production and the melting of our polar caps is too strong to ignore. And so this seems like, if you could imagine, obviously this is taken out of a paper, um, this would have strong logos if we could see all of the evidence to show that that correlation does in, indeed exist, but let's just say we believe it does. And in that case, um, this reasoning seems to be of high quality. And then ethos, scientists who have studied the evidence agree that we must diminish, if not completely halt our reliance on fossil fuel consumption if we are to stop global warming. And then to follow that up with the appeal to the emotions, our very survival as the human race demands that we stop using fossil fuels to power our economies. And so you can imagine if you're writing a paper, let's imagine you're writing a research manuscript. If you are in the process of writing several narrative paragraphs, these sort of appeals, these rhetorical appeals can get lost in the mix of all the other texts that you're pulling together. So I think it's helpful as a writer to be able to step back and look at these sort of appeals on their own. You could maybe put them in a table or you could highlight them just to make sure that you really think that you're meeting sort of what the emphasis is for each of those appeals. And I'm going to give you some very specific examples today um, using a thesis statement. So I'll get to that in just a moment. So it's also important to think about how argumentation differs across disciplines. I know that many of you here today are from different disciplines. We have educators, we have psychologists, we have folks in the STEM fields. And so what I talk about today is very high level. So I'm really focusing on the common ground, sort of regardless of the discipline. But I do want to acknowledge that there are differences. So depending on your discipline, the nature of the claims that you use and what, is, what counts as evidence, um, and how that evidence is used to support claims. Also, the specific, the specific rhetorical devices that you're using um, will likely differ based on your discipline. 
especially you know if you're in your humanities or you're a history major, yeah, your argumentation, your argumentative skills might be, um, your writing might look quite different than someone who stay in the healthcare field. So sort of regardless of your discipline, there's sort of these, so these central core components of an argument. And when I go into these different argumentative writing methods at the end of today's presentation, you'll see that there are sometimes more components than this, um, depending on sort of the writing structure you want to follow and the purpose of the argument. But let's just focus on these for now. We're going to start by talking about a thesis and then a claim and then evidence and then counter argument. And so the thesis is just the main idea of the paper. I do want to point out that some folks call the thesis the main claim of the paper. So I'll sometimes use that synonymously. And then claim, we talked yesterday about simple and complex claims. You could view these as I defined them yesterday and I'll define them again today. It's just a simple decorative truth that's open to debate. Some people call these subclaims based on the thesis. Evidence is just data. And then the counter argument is just a different viewpoint. And so we're going to go into these into more depth with examples. Okay, so a thesis statement. Some folks call this a purpose statement, a problem statement. Some people call this a central claim. I guess that the terminology can't get confusing, but I'm going to try to stick to a thesis statement. So a thesis statement is often located in the introduction of a paper, but in scientific publications, it could be located in the discussion section of the article. So this is where it's important to be familiar with um, the discourse within your discipline and how different sorts of papers or articles are constructed. It's the main idea of the paper. It must be supported by evidence. And it also guides the reader by really clearly explicating what the article is and how it's going to be supported in the paper. So I put this graph again because I, I can't tell you how many times I have this conversation where I'll talk to, well, one of my doctoral students, I was just meeting with someone earlier last week. And when they come to me, they talk to me about their ideas. They talk to me broadly about their topic, but they don't yet have the ability, they're not maybe ready or confident enough to take that and um, transform it into a thesis. And so I thought that this visual would be helpful because you start with an idea, maybe that's your exact research topic, maybe it's a broader version of your topic that you're working on narrowing. And then over time, you see these wheels here. So the wheels are turning, you're reading, you're critiquing, you're analyzing. And then what comes out of that is your thesis statement. And so here's an example of a thesis statement. Also, like I said earlier, for the terminology, a central claim. So if we look at this, you can see here that the writer says, I will argue that. And then we have some hedging, although it is challenging to isolate the contributing factors of nurse burnout. This occupational phenomenon can be diminished if healthcare organizations prioritize the implementation of interventions to reduce workplace stressors. And then we have the pathos here, the emotional appeal. Recognizing the urgent need to address nurse burnout is essential to safeguarding the well being of healthcare providers and maintaining the quality of patient care. Thus, compelling stakeholders to prioritize comprehensive interventions and foster a supportive work environment. So, we're going to use this thesis statement as an example as we work through these other components of the argument. So you can see how the evidence comes together so that you can evaluate the logos, the quality of the reasoning, um, and then the ethos, the credibility and the veracity of the argument. So before we do that, before I give you the example, I wanna break down a claim in case you missed yesterday's presentation. So a claim is just a declarative truth that's open to debate. The central claim is sometimes called the thesis statement. Uh, then you have these subclaims, which can be topic sentences for body paragraphs, although you might have one claim that sort of covers the information across several paragraphs, depending on how much evidence you have. Claims must be supported by evidence. Developing a claim, just like developing a thesis statement, requires knowledge of the topic. 
and your ability to analyze the available evidence and draw conclusions. And then a claim can be simple or complex. So let's look at an example. So I took the central claim, the thesis statement that I just read in the slide before last, and I just kind of made up some subclaims that perhaps maybe you would expect in, let's just imagine that this is a literature review that someone that, let's say an early career faculty member is pulling a literature review together for a proposal. And based off of the central claim, these are some subclaims that are present throughout the literature review. And I think that these are, I made these up, but I believe that they're all logically connected to the central claim. So these are the subclaims. Rates of nurse burnout have increased over the past decade. Nurse burnout is a complex and multidimensional phenomenon. Researchers have struggled to isolate factors contributing to nurse burnout. Several interventions have been developed to effectively reduce burnout. And then the most successful interventions target stressors in the work environment. So one of the most common issues that I see in someone's writing is when they're trying to do too much within a, a short, if, especially if they're limited in their word count. And so what you want, don't want to do when you're building out your argument is to make the mistake of you know, stuffing a ton of claims in the one paragraph and then trying to put all the evidence together under that because it's going to be hard to follow. It's hard for the reader to follow sort of that logical chain of reasoning that you're trying to create. And so I think it's helpful to break out all of those claims and first address them separately. And then you can consider possibly maybe how you could combine some of that information to consolidate the argument. But let's look at this example. So I can show you sort of the logos and the ethos, those rhetorical appeals. So I just chose one of those subclaims. Several workplace interventions have been developed to effectively reduce nurse burnout. So I want you to take a moment and just read the evidence here. I have this piece of evidence, and then I put in a totally separate piece of evidence. And I put the verses because what I would like for you to consider is either or, which of these aspects of evidence are appropriate for supporting the claim. So I'll give you a moment to read this. Okay, so let's take a moment to break this down. So hopefully you realize that this first one, a systematic review by Brenner et al, that this piece of evidence fits the claim. It supports the claim. It directly addresses workplace interventions. And the claim is about how there are several interventions have been developed to effectively reduce burnout. And so they're showing that here. They're talking about the workplace interventions. This is a systematic review, which as hopefully if you're a researcher, you know that that's at the highest level of evidence. And then we have these specific types of interventions, um, those addressing high workload and staffing issues, and then interventions designed to address interpersonal conflict. So this perfectly fits this claim. In this one, workplace stressors are commonly reported within the literature, which include high workload, staffing issues. So it looks obvious that it doesn't fit the claim when you pull it out and you put it into this table, but it's really challenging to catch these sort of um, malalignment issues whenever you're writing, especially because oftentimes we are reading articles, we're taking notes, we're writing, we're going back and we're revising, we're you know copying and pasting and moving around information. And so things can sort of get lost in that process. And so that's why I think it's helpful to be able to pull your information out, maybe put it into a table or put it into a Word document and organize it like I talked about yesterday, where you sort of bullet out the pieces of evidence under a claim. So it makes it a lot easier for you to assess, to make sure that you haven't uh, accidentally included evidence that does not support that claim. 
Also notice that this tends to happen when you are including too much sort of peripheral information about maybe a specific study um, within the section where you're including the evidence. So it can, because it distracts the reader from the claim. And so in this scenario, perhaps the citation by Lunda et al, this source was maybe included in the study by Brenner, the systematic review. And maybe that's why it got mixed up within this section of writing. Um, it's hard to say, but when you pull it out and you're able to look at it in this very clear and cut way, it makes it a lot clearer when there's sort of issues around the logical connection between ideas. And then this idea of ethos, is it believable and true? Um, yes, I do believe that the information presented here is believable and true. I think that's a little easier to um, assert. Let's look at one more. I'm going to let you uh, read this to yourself again, and then I'll talk through it. We're doing the same thing. We're, we're considering whether or not the evidence supports the claim and whether uh, it's believable and true, and we're choosing between one of these. Okay, I'm going to break this down. So let's first look at the claim. The claim is just stating that nurse burnout is a complex and multidimensional phenomenon. That's a pretty straightforward claim. So if we were forced to choose between these two pieces of evidence and our criteria for evaluating these are, does the evidence support the claims? That's first. And then is it believable and true? So this first piece of evidence, uh, I believe, does support the claim, and it is believable and true. Right away, the author says, several studies have identified multiple dimensions of nurse burnout. And so this is an another sort of rhetorical device, is repetition. So repeating keywords in the claim when you're presenting the evidence is very helpful for explicitly showing this logos aspect showing that the evidence supports the claim by repeating key terms. Um, and then you don't even have to continue reading this. Right away, we see multiple dimensions. Um, we see that the systematic review found consistent evidence of these dimensions across healthcare settings. And then we have more information about the sort of intricate interplay, which goes back to this idea of complex and multidimensional. Whereas the second piece of evidence, while it may be believable and true, it does not support the claim. This idea of a statistically significant association between burnout and patient outcomes is not directly related to this claim. And so it's really important for you to make sure that what you're claiming is directly supported by the evidence. And I made these very simplified. You may have sort of six pieces of evidence that you're having the weave together to support a claim. Um, and that's perfectly fine. Maybe it's not a single systematic review. Maybe it's four separate individual studies. Um, and that's also commonly done. And the way you group those together in order to, to make that point about the evidence um, is really, is highly dependent. Those are just some decisions that you have to make as a writer. Okay, so now we're going to transition to counter arguments, which are another key component of an argument. And counter arguments are really important. And why is that? So first of all, they enhance your credibility and they demonstrate that you are not biased, that you have done the work and you understand that there are different viewpoints on this topic within your field. And that's important, especially if you are a student, especially if you're writing a research manuscript or there may be um, significant seminal work on that topic, or maybe it's a highly controversial issue in the moment. 
that's something that I've noticed quite a bit as I'm writing these manuscripts on generative AI. There's a lot of controversy about generative AI right now in education, well, in academia in general. And so it's important for me to acknowledge those different viewpoints whenever I'm writing these articles. That's an important part of my argumentation. And so while it might seem obvious what a counter argument is, I'm going to define it anyways. Um, as you're thinking about a counter argument, argument, think about what are the opposing views within the literature or within your field, and then think about what your position is and how are you going to respond to this counter argument. So, and in this process, you're trying to be fair and objective, and you're trying to be, or you should be, consistent with your original position. So you're not kind of going back and forth on your original position. You're staying true to what that original position is. And some common mistakes that happen in this process is maybe choosing an opposing view that's not truly connected to the claim. Maybe you're reaching a bit and that sort of logical connection isn't there or obvious to the reader. And if you're having, I'll just say this too, if you find that you're having to make some logical leaps in order to build that connection, but you can indeed build the connection, then that makes it all the more important for you to be very explicit about what that connection is in your writing. That's your job as a writer. Another common mistake is making sort of sweeping statements um, that are not supported by evidence, listing out a bunch of facts instead of actually shaping the counter argument to show what the actual counter argument is, or using overly emotional language that doesn't correctly um, reflect the source's intention. So this is actually very important. It may be that some of the language you're using has an emotional appeal, but if you're citing a source that includes an opposing viewpoint, then the language that you use needs to accurately reflect that source's intention. So if that source is not using emotional language, um, then you should not be using emotional language, uh, sort of putting words in their mouth. So let's look at a counter argument. Using this claim, uh, I'm going back to this, this same topic of nurse burnout. So if we go back to the claim, several workplace interventions have been developed to effectively reduce nurse burnout, then let's just imagine that this is a counter argument. I'm gonna give you just a moment to read this silently and then I'll sort of point out what I underlined. So I don't know what you think, but I would say that this is a pretty strong counter argument. Now, again, this is taken out of context of a full paper. So you just almost have to imagine some of the evidence that's been put forth earlier in the paper to, to back up this claim. But let's just imagine that that's all there and it adds up. It meets those three rhetorical appeals. This counter argument is strongly worded. It's logical. So it also meets these um, components of logos and ethos. Uh, the information here supports the claim. So for the counter argument, the counter argument here is to that claim, but the counter argument also has a claim. The counter arguments claim is while it's true that several workplace interventions have been developed, their effectiveness in practice remains uncertain. And so the logos here is what is the quality of the reasoning? Does the evidence support the claim and the counter argument? And it does. The authors here talk about um, mixed results regarding the effectiveness, and they go on to cite some very specific studies. And there are many different writing templates you can use to get to this, because I, I find that you know staring at a blank page can be very challenging. So having a writing template is, is very useful. 
And so I certainly wouldn't expect you to sit down and maybe uh, draft this counter argument from scratch. I think it would take some time to get this sort of wordsmithing down. Um, but these are all based on writing templates. This idea of starting out a sentence with some studies have shown mixed results regarding sort of X, whatever the topic is, suggesting that blank. Um, those are different writing templates that I'm going to share with you from the academic phrase bank. But hopefully you can see here how this is a robust counter argument that also meets those sort of criteria of um, logos and ethos. This is an ineffective counter argument. Um, we have the same claim that we're sort of presenting the opposing viewpoint for. Um, I'll give you a moment just to read that and hopefully you'll see some of the differences here between the effective one I just showed you and this one. So hopefully you can see here the difference. There's no evidence, but let's imagine, you know, there was some evidence that wouldn't necessarily make it a good counter argument. Um, the counter argument that this person is putting forward um, uses a lot of should, should be able to, should have, it uses a strong wording in terms of um, expect individual nurses to take responsibility for their own well-being. And so if someone is like, let's imagine that you're trying to develop a counter argument to this claim. So let's flip it around. Um, this would not be an effective counter argument. You would want to, just like you would with the first part of the argument we were talking about earlier, is you want to make sure that you're um, making claims that be, can be logically supported by evidence um, and not just using sort of sweeping statements that are not justified. Uh, and again, it, this all looks, I think, more obvious when you take it out of context and put it on a PowerPoint, but I think you would be really surprised to see how often I see sort of um, strongly worded or sweeping statements like this within um, sort of embedded within a longer piece of writing. So these are the writing templates I was talking about. For those of you not familiar, um, the Academic Phrase Bank is a wonderful resource. You can go to their website and you can find writing templates for um, counter arguments and, and many more other components of writing. They even have um, a PDF that you can download if you're sort of old school and you prefer to print out uh, your resources. But I definitely recommend um, that website if you haven't used it before. Okay, so all of this comes together for these different argumentative writing methods. So I'm going to present three to you today, the Tolman, the classical, and the Rogerian writing, argumentative writing methods. And I'm going to share examples with you. We won't have time to go through those examples together, but I think if one of these really speaks to you, then you can go through the example on your own um, and do some further research into it. So we're going to start with the Tolman method. Uh, this one is ideal for building a logical chain of reasoning to support your argument. And so I have a QR code here if you want to download a full PDF version of a Tolman method essay, um, then you can look at that. And this method is, it works on, so all of these work on basic assumptions. We always have assumptions going into our writing. So the underlying assumption is that the audience will support your argument if the claims are logically supported with evidence. So this argumentative writing method is perfectly in line with everything we've discussed up until now. And I say it is the most common one that I see and that I tend to, to lean on when I'm um, coaching a student or a client, or even if I'm trying to strengthen my argument. And so the format, the structure is the claim, the data, the evidence, warrant, backing, counterclaim, and rebuttal. So there's a lot of components here. I'm going to define those for you. 
So the claim is, like I said earlier, it can be the overall thesis statement. That's where we're using these synonymous, these terms synonymously. Data is your evidence used to support your claim. Warrant is why your evidence supports the claim. And that's where your job as a writer is to not um, make the reader try to read your mind. Uh, you want to explain, make it very clear why your evidence supports the claim. And then the backing is just the additional logic or reasoning to support the warrant. The counterclaim is the counter argument, presenting counterclaims in an unbiased manner. And then rebuttal is your response to the counterclaim. And this is where it's really important to maintain that original position, positioning that you put forth within your main thesis statement. So again, if you scan this QR code, you can see a full essay from, and that's from the APA. Uh, website. I know we're running out of time, so I'll go, go through these. So Rogerian is for focusing on controversial issues. So perhaps um, next week you're writing about uh, a method where you're writing about a topic that would be appropriate to use the Toolman method. You know, this week maybe you're writing about a controversial issue, so you decide to use the Rogerian method. Uh, the underlying assumption for this method is that the audience will believe that your argument is reasonable if you present it objectively and highlight the common ground between different perspectives. And this format includes an introduction, an opposing view, a statement of understanding, a statement of your position, a statement of context, and a statement of benefits. And this is also really helpful if you sort of have a middle ground argument where you see both sides and there's an argument for both sides. Um, you're not necessarily picking a side. So again, I have a QR code here if you want to download um, a full PDF of a Rigerian argument. I'm going to define this format too. So the introduction of a Rigerian argument may or may not have a thesis statement, but regardless the issue, is uh, should be stated as objectively as possible. Then you present a counter argument without judgment, you're not picking sides. And then you provide a statement of understanding, you're acknowledging that that opposing view is valid despite these other opposing viewpoints. You explain your stance, and then you provide examples, specific examples of when your argument is most appropriate. And then you explain the advantages of your argument. So as you can see, this is different from the Toolman method. And that's because the purpose is different. This is for controversial issues. I'm gonna leave that up in case you want to scan that. And then finally, we have the classical method. This is when this is appropriate or most useful when you're defining um, a, a concept or when you're really showing the application of evidence. And so I, I imagine this as like you're in a courtroom and you are making an opening statement and then you're presenting evidence. And the goal is for the reader to see what the action needs to be based on all of the evidence available. So maybe you're not trying to convince them up front. You just believe that the evidence speaks for itself. So you're applying that evidence. And this is formatted according to an introduction, a background, proposition, proof, refutation, and conclusion. And again, I have the QR code if you want to see a full classical essay. And then I'll define these. So the introduction is you're stating the issue and its significance. In the background, you're helping the audience understand the issue by presenting contextual and historical information. You're then stating your claims. So here the claims are. Uh, not as early in the paper as they were in the other methods. Then you're presenting your proof. This is your evidence. Then you present your counter arguments, and then you provide a conclusion. You summarize your main points and draw a declarative conclusion. And so this is where your sort of thesis statement sits, is in the conclusion of the classical argument after you've presented your evidence and the counter argument. So as you can see, even though they don't necessarily call these counter arguments, each of these methods has a counter argument. The refutation, and this one, the counter argument is the opposing view, which is earlier in the paper. And then the Tolman is do, 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 counterclaim. So counter arguments are included in all of those. 
And again, I have those QR codes for you. If you didn't have time to scan it now, don't panic. You will get the handouts. You'll get another chance to. Okay, Whew. I presented a lot of information. Again, that was very high level. I normally uh, teach that in a series of workshops. So thank you for bearing with me. I tried to, to put in as much as possible. Um, let's take a few minutes for q and I'm going to open up the q and Let me just close this. Jessica, I can help if you want yeah, to give sure. a looking at them. Um, so let me see on the top. Um, are counter arguments necessary for all subject topics within the explanation of the background slash lit review? Say that one more time. Let me. Are sorry. Are counter arguments necessary for all subtopics within the explanation of the background or lit review? Uh, yeah, so it's, I always struggle when, you know, people want sort of a declarative sweeping statement about always or never, and it's just not that simple. It really depends. So I'll just go back to the example of, um, you know, a research article that I, I just submitted last week about generative AI. It would, I would really be amiss if I didn't address the controversies, um, all of the concerns surrounding generative AI. And so it's really up to you. You have to decide based off of, even if you don't write about the opposing views, you need to make sure that you understand what the counter arguments are within your field. And then you need to make a decision about whether or not that's relevant to include within the writing. Um, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Uh, it is highly dependent, but what you don't want to happen, you know, let's just imagine you're a doctoral student what you don't want to happen is for your writing to come across as biased just for, or for your committee or your advisors to think that you're not familiar with all of the literature and that you don't know that there are counter arguments. So it could be that you mention them and then you quickly provide your rebuttal, or perhaps you need to go in depth because it's central to your overall argument or for the reader to understand your topic. Sorry, I know that was a long-winded answer, but... No, no, thank you. Uh, and this might sort of go with this. Do we need argument and counter argument for each claim? No. So this is where the terminology, depending on what you're reading, can be confusing. <clears throat> so let's imagine that your thesis statement, your overall thesis statement is where you're putting your argument sort of up front. You're telling the reader exactly what you're going to argue. And so that thesis statement might be sub might be supported. Let's say you're writing, I don't know, a 15 page lit review, you might have 15 different complex claims that all go back to support that thesis statement. And then there's evidence organized under those claims. And so I think of it as your overarching thesis statement. You have claims that you're going to make that are all related to the thesis statement. And then you have evidence to support each claim. Um, and then, um, so would a counter argument normally be part of the same paragraph or would one need to create a separate meal, M-E-A-L, uh, for it? That's what you showed yesterday. <laughs> so, yeah, the meal plan paragraph. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it just, dep it depends. So much of this is really dependent upon what you're writing and how much space you have. If you have, you know, a really tight word count that you're working with, like the article I was just writing was a brief communication. So my lit review was only about three paragraphs. And so I only used about two sentences to address sort of the opposing views. Um, and, and so, but if you have more space and you're expected to provide this like comprehensive overview of the opposing views and your responses to them, then it would look quite, different. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, it, what is a better style of writing arguments? Active voice using in first person, I, we, or passive voice? We've had a couple questions on this. Yeah. So active voice, for sure, um, is, is definitely preferred when you're presenting an argument. Um, APA, it also depends on your style. So APA prefers active over passive voice in first person. 
um, over second or third person. Uh, so those are my preferences, but there are you know, some journals, different style guides have different guidelines. And so it's important for you to also understand the um, style that's expected within your field. I'm just doing a, a chat, <laughs> multitasking. Um, so some people said that, I mean, is there a difference when you're doing more scientific research in making your argument? Or is it the same? I mean, it's definitely, so I, I had a slide in the beginning about argumentation across the disciplines. And so this is discipline specific and I'll actually drop in, um, let me drop in the chat. This article does a really good job of explaining that. It's quite long. So I only pulled out bits and pieces of it, but let me put this, I'm, I think I have to close out of this to grab it. One second, I'll put this in the chat and then you can download this and read about. That we tried, people couldn't access it. I tried to, the link didn't work. So mm -hmm. I went to ResearchGate. I, that's the best I could do to find it. That is so weird. I just had it open this morning. I Let know, me that's, what, that's what happens. <laughs> yeah, I don't know so why. We can put it in uh, the lobby later too, chat for people. Yeah, I took it directly from the PDF this morning. Here we go. I have it. I can drop it in really quick. Okay, I'll put this file in. I think this is helpful. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, then we'll move on to the Satavi and Vivo presentations. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, okay, so then people have questions about some of the methods, the uh, Rogerian, um, let's see, can we use, so for us, um, uh, when talking about the Tolman format, is this format within a paragraph or the overall format suggestion for the paper? Overall for the paper. So all of those three methods would be based on a paper that's following that um, sort of argumentative writing method. So the examples that I gave, um, or unfortunately, I think for undergrad or grad student essays, obviously they can, you can write them as a doctoral student or as a faculty member or as a, you know, if you're writing a technical report and you want to follow an argumentative structure. Um, but those were the only ones I could find where it was a full essay where I trusted the source that these are good examples. Um, so those are on the, um, I believe it's the Purdue OWL website that that links to. But yeah, that structure is for a paper. Um, I have seen folks like condense that down into a couple of paragraphs when they're writing, um, sort of trying to fit all of that into maybe the background section of, a, of an article, uh, which is fine too. And I think if you, now that you know these methods, start just noticing as you're reading articles, if you're noticing that the language is argumentative, just start noticing that the way that they're structuring the writing. I think when you start doing that, you start to see how often these different argumentative writing methods are reflected within um, the writing of research articles, um, even online editorials when we're crafting arguments. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, thanks everyone. So, um, and just wanna say that, that, you know, stay tuned for the next part of this presentation, but you know, the, the exhibit booths are open. Uh, Jessica will be at her booth. You can get information about Vivo, Satavi, other products. So we have representatives at them and then they'll be open till three too. So you can go after the breakout sessions. All right, I'm just going to share my screen. Thank, thanks, that was a great presentation. Um, so just, I'm going to move into talking about how to use Satavi to help you with organizing your um, arguments and counter -ar arguments using, trying to copy sort of what Jessica did, but in the software. Uh, but just to let you know and understand the difference between Satavi and Invivo, I think the slide um, is helpful. So Satavi is reference management and writing software. So it, it, it's more robust than like EndNote or Zotero Mendeley because it has this writing component to it. Um, and it can help you organize your second, oh, I didn't mean to go there, secondary sources, your outlining, synthesizing, task planning, formatting, <clears throat> and then in vivo is meant for qualitative data analysis. So it's your uh, primary resources, the sources that you're collecting, your focus groups, interviews, 
and it helps you with analysis and coding and finding patterns, but they overlap because now Satavi integrates with Envivo. So it overlaps to help you write your literature review, uh, your notes, uh, you can collaborate um, with your team with both of these products um, and it will help you with your final writing. So I just wanna talk about that um, before I go into the software. Um, okay, so when I go into, so I'm in Satavi here, and so this is a, a project I created to, to sort of talk about the, the claims and the counter arguments, um, but just to give you sort of a, a review of, of how to work in Satavi. So right now I'm in the reference tab, which allows me to get to all my different um, references here, uh, and then once I click on a reference, I can see the um, the, the metadata here. So it's going to tell me the, the article, the authors, the um, data publication and all that. And then I can easily go change views. So if I want to read through the article and start highlighting and adding things, which I'll show you in a minute, um, I can easily do that in Satavi. Uh, the next part is the knowledge organizer. And you can see here, I have basically created an outline to sort of help me um, start organizing this, this concept that, um, that what uh, Jessica was talking about. So, you know, I can, whenever I find something that's going to help me sort of explain and write about my thesis or main idea, I can bring it in here, my claims and, and this uh, literature I have is about coastal environmental changes in a coastal community. So those are the type of uh, resources I'm reading. So I, I broke this up just like, you know, climate changing coasts. When, when do I see, I have a claim that yes, they, they are changing. Climate is affecting the economy in these areas. Those are my claims. And then I have areas where I have evidence to back up these claims. So this is, you know, you could organize it differently, but that's just where I thought would make sense. And then, you know, my counter, counter arguments, um, you know, climate's always changing or economic need, our economic needs are more important than worrying about climate change. So I started thinking about what are the counter arguments too. Uh, so I set up this outline and then I have tasks. So if I'm working on my own, I can assign myself tasks to help me organize. Uh, or if I'm working with my team, I can assign my teammates tasks too, so that we can work together on this project. So I, I'll go back to references. And <clears throat> so in Satavi, I can um, you know, read through an article and decide, you know, what's important to me and based on um, what I need to write about. So I can, you know, do a couple of things. I could, you know, highlight if I want to do that for the first pass, you know, this, this, I want it, this seems important. Um, or I can just start right away um, creating and deciding to do a direct quote for this uh, paragraph, an indirect quote, a summary of this or a comment. So if I go to direct quote here, um, I have a core statement that I can um, shorten or change. Um, so that looks pretty good to me. And then I can add it to my outline here. So is this going to be part of my, you know, help me come up and think about my main idea or thesis? Or is it going to be one of my claims? I could do two at the same time if I want to and then I save it. Um, and then when I go to the knowledge item and I go to theme, um, for example, to main ideas and click here, um, I have what was written and then also the citation with it. You can also, maybe you have evidence, um, there's a, a graph uh, you know, that's showing evidence that's going to help you. Um, build uh, your your claim, uh, you could go through and pick um, the snapshot here. So I'm going to grab this chart and do an image quotation. And same thing, the caption here, that's what will show underneath um, the picture when we bring it into a Word document. And I can add it to my claims or my evidence. Maybe I want to show and under climate is changing on the coast. So I'll do a few more. Um, so maybe for this, I want to do something that's um, 
a indirect quote. So I'm going to be paraphrasing here. So and shows that the puzzle man does not. Okay, so maybe this is better if I say natural causes. So I know what this uh, section's about. And, um, and then I would write in my own, my own, do my own paraphrasing here. And then I can, um, <laughs> click on. And I somehow, where did I put it? Oh, here it is. <laughs> I meant to, to save it. Ah. Got to open it up and save it. All right. So now when I go um, back to the knowledge items, I can do a few things. If I want to start writing this up for my first draft, um, Oh, before I do that, let me just show you one more thing, which I think is um, helpful in Satavi. If I want, I could even um, write a summary or a comment about the full, pa uh, full paper here. So maybe I want to think about, is this something I want to use for my lit review um, or my, my paper? Um, I'll just write you or something like that. And then I can write my summary of it if it's it's worth using, or uh, maybe it's a certain topic I want to use, and that will help me. And I can assign it also to the, the outline if I want. Um, so if I go to the knowledge item here, I have this outline, and I, I can, if I want, I can um, export this uh, to a Word document, and it will bring all that information into the Word document. Um, and I have one here. So I decided I'm going to use, I think it was the tool, Toolman um, method. And so I can go to Satavi, uh, the word add-in, go to Satavi pane here. And hmm, I just had this. And why isn't it showing? <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm going to open up. I'm going to export. I think that will work. Uh, I think I did um, something before that I didn't mean to. I was in a Word document. Okay, here it is. So now I have, um, this was the uh, project I was working in. So now I have a Word document that's going, it's going to help me start building out my information. So if I go to the knowledge tab here, this is what I had for uh, the, so I can go down here and double click and it's going to bring in the information that I had for this. So this is what I'd brought in <clears throat> uh, from, in the project where I looked at the resources. So it does a citation for me. And then also creates a reference, starts creating the references for me. Um, so I can keep doing this. So if I want, you know, have my claim. Um, so I have some information here, so I can add that, this one here. So it's going to start adding this information. So it's going, I'm going now have, um, you know, build out my my rough draft, which is is nice. So you don't have a blank uh, page, which is always uh, sometimes. So if I I have evidence, oops, I want to go to the coast here. I can add the evidence. So I can decide what I want to add here too. Now there is a way to add. Um, everything all at once, insert all. So you could do everything at once and bring it in too. It just depends on how you want to work. Um, and you can see it's building that bibliography for me. Um, and I can also, if I need to um, change the citation style. So Satavi has hundreds of citation styles. So let's say I want to change it uh, to another one. I can, but I can always go back to APA. So again, you're starting your, your first draft here. So I'm going to stop there and um, let Laura take over and show you in vivo.
That's great, Stacy. Thank you. And I just noticed a few questions in the Q&A, and maybe it's helpful if we just reiterate again, the um, uh, questions are around what is the difference between in vivo and Citavi, and what can one do that the other cannot? So I think I, when I get into my demonstration, that'll help a little bit, but maybe you want to speak to that first. Sure. Think of your using Citavi when you're doing your lit review, right? So it's when you're reading through uh, all your articles and you need a way to organize that and make sure you have all the information about what you know the experts say about your topic. And Vivo is going to help you primarily with the data you collect as a researcher. So your interviews, focus groups, or video audio, um, and help you analyze and bring that in. But what's great is now you can use both together and Laura is going to show you in vivo now, but you can use both together to help you um, analyze your lit review uh, in, a, in a more robust way in in vivo. And then when you go to write your final paper, um, you'll have what the experts say in in vivo with the lit review, the information you brought into with Satavi with your own research analysis. So then when you go to write your findings, it's all right there. So that's Satavi, yeah. yeah, lit review. Uh, and Vivo is qualitative data analysis software for the research you collect. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you who were here yesterday and or sat in on the either one of the breakout sessions yesterday, I think um, if you if you sat in on one breakout session, I would encourage you to look at the recording for the other breakout session that will help you start to sort that out. I would also suggest that we can use in vivo for lit reviews, um, doing kind of theming and analysis across the literature sources, even if you're not using Citavi. So you might want to consider using um, in vivo uh, to begin your lit review um, and uh, use it to theme across the sources and then begin your writing in memo. So one of the strengths of Citavi that I think is just incredible is that you're able to build the outline for your paper and add the references to it and then export that as uh, Stacy just demonstrated so that you're actually starting with a rough draft with references in it. And you might move those around, but at least you've got a place to start built on the reading that you actually did. So yesterday I talked about using in vivo to gather and theme uh, across um, literature sources. And today I'm gonna switch gears and I'm going to show you how in vivo is used when you've got your own sources for your own research if you're doing research that includes qualitative data. So switching gears, although we can use in vivo for lit review and think of the literature as our source, and tomorrow I'll show what happens when we bring those all together. But today I'm going to show you the, um, the way a project looks and how it works when you're using qualitative data as all or part of your um, research uh, data. So if you've been doing uh, qualitative research, and you're looking now to do the analysis of it, then this is what I'm gonna to demonstrate today. So we're switching gears a little bit from the lit review part of it to actual data collection and working with qualitative data. I would say that even uh, thinking about what uh, Jessica presented and being able to make strong claims from the data is well supported by having your um, analysis in in vivo as well, because you want to be able then to demonstrate the claims that you're making about what you found in your data with that same strong argument and evidence from your own research that will actually uh, back up the claims. So that process of doing that, whether it's in the literature or in your own data is still um, uh, strengthened by the use of software like in vivo. So for today, I'm going to um, take you into the sample project that's built into every copy of NVivo. And as um, I did yesterday, I'm going to be using NVivo for Windows and I'm using NVivo 14, which is the latest version of NVivo. If you are using NVivo for Mac or you're using um, an older version of NVivo, things may look slightly different. But no matter which version you're using, there is a sample project built into NVivo. And I would encourage you to uh, open and use that sample project just to, to help you see how things are created, 
organized, what you can do in NVivo. You can open and use the sample project many, many times, as many times as you want. You can change it around. I often go back to the sample project if I'm thinking about setting up a new NVivo project and want to see how they did it. So in this welcome window, I'm going to click on sample project and it's going to open. And it is a project similar to the data that Stacy showed in the lit review. This is a project that was created for real research many years ago now about environmental change on the eastern seaboard of the US. And uh, the project is called Environmental Change Down East. And I like to show people around in vivo using this sample project for a couple of reasons. One is you can always go back to it if you have in vivo, you can take a look. And the other is it's an example of what I would call a mature project. So a mature project is um, a project that has lots of data in it and has lots of coding in it and is um, very, very um, uh, uh, kind of uh, well, well into the analysis process. So when you first open the sample project, you may want to um, do this tour. We're gonna skip that for today. And for those who weren't here yesterday or for those who are um, uh, welcoming a refresher, let me just orient you to a little bit to what you're seeing. So this blue window on the left-hand side, this blue column on the left-hand side is a list of all of the folders and all of the items that are in this project. So you will see that the four folders are organized into three different sections, import, organize, and explore. And these kind of give you a hint about what belongs in each of these folders. In the data folder, there are multiple subfolders, and you can see those by clicking on the arrows. And if I click on a given folder, like my interviews folder, then I'll be able to see all of the contents of that folder. And uh, so in this folder, I have the interviews that were done for the project. And if I click on a, um, a piece of information or data that's in that folder, it opens in yet another window off to the right, um, the detail view there. So high level overview, this is all the folders, all the items that have been imported into the project or created in the project. By clicking on a folder, I can see everything that's inside that folder. And by clicking on the item, I can see the item open on the window on the right hand side. If I want, I can have more than one uh, project uh, item open. So I can have uh, uh, multiple uh, windows um, or tabs open that show the various interviews that I might be working with or other pieces of data I might be working with. So let's say I'm doing this project and we've done a number of interviews um, with the, these kinds of folks and notice that you can have different formats. You'll see different icons here. So I could see that Ella, Helen's interview, for instance, is actually an audio file and someone actually created a transcript summarizing what was said every 30 seconds. So you can use different formats of data in the project and you can see that those are um, different by looking at the different files uh, icons, okay? There's video files, audio files and documents. Mostly I find people are still doing their analysis mostly on documents. So we'll stick with that for the rest of today's demo. And when I have a document open, then Often what we want to do is this process in qualitative analysis that we call coding. And coding is the process of reading and reviewing an article that, and then separating out pieces of the article into the various topics that you think are of interest or of relevance to the research question that you're working on. And as we gather those articles, we create a section, a special section or grouping uh, called codes. And codes are those areas that we put the pieces of information that we gathered from our data that are relevant to that topic. So for instance, you'll see here, I went down and clicked on this codes folder, and I can see that in this project, there's been a number of codes created. And if I open, this balance code, for instance, you can see everything that the coders or analysts have um, 
created or assigned or coded to the balance code. And everything in the balance code should be um, related to or an example of the topic of balance that has been talked about in the interviews. So I once the code is taking a moment to open, there it is. So once we have that code open, for instance, I can uh, scroll up and down through that code and I can see not only this um, chunk of text, but the place that it came from. So by I can look up here and I can see that this reference came from Barbara's interview. And this digital reference came from Betty and uh, Paul's interview, which is a uh, video. So this was coding on the actual video file. And uh, so on, if I scroll further down, I can see excerpts from Thomas's interview, William's interview, and so on. So in this process of coding, what typically happens is that uh, I've got an article open and I would be reading and thinking about what I'm seeing here and then coding that section to the relevant um, uh, code that it belongs to. So I might select this piece of information and maybe I think this is about family connection and a sense of community. Let me just see if there's any codes that seem, yeah, they have a local connection. And I'm just going to code that to the local connection uh, code. And if I open the local connection code, I should be able to go and see um, that chunk of text that I just coded there. Mm -hmm. The way you set up your codes and coding structure varies depending on the research method that you're, um, uh, you have laid out for your research. So it's very possible that you have um, a different way of beginning your coding depending on the way that you have structured your research methods. So I, I just wanted to go down and see, we took that from Richard and Patricia's interview. So I just wanna go down and make sure that we've got that coded there. Mary and James, there's Richard and Patricia. So this is the little piece that I just coded there. So the way you begin the coding and in the breakout session, I'll take you through this a little bit more step-by-step, step, but you might begin by setting up a, a, a list of codes of the topics that you already know you're going to need based on, let's say, a theoretical framework or some kind of guiding um, framework for your coding structure, perhaps based on previous research, perhaps based on uh, certain things that you're looking for, and so on. So it's possible to create a list of codes before you've even begun um, collecting data, and you would then begin to do your reading and coding and code into that structure based on those codes. And you would probably begin to create additional codes as you continued the research. In other types of research, let's say something like grounded theory or other um, inductive methods of doing coding, you're actually reading and thinking about what you're seeing and reading and creating codes as you progress in the reading of the um, data that you've got. Tomorrow's sessions, there's some breakout sessions, and one of those sessions is about thematic analysis. And I would encourage you to, to, if you're interested in doing thematic analysis, to attend that session because you'll get a, a more uh, robust look at the way that the codes change over time. And you might um, uh, really benefit by seeing how at different phases of the thematic analysis that coding structure evolves. So... Again, you might start with a list of codes. If you're doing a deductive approach, you might create codes as you're, begin, as you're reading from the ground up. But as you're reading, you're coding, you're creating um, more and more uh, information in the code about the topic that's of interest to you. As one other way of doing the coding, and you might do more than one way of coding within any given approach, is to also code by the research question. So it's perfectly okay to also code all of the responses to question one to a question one code, all of the responses to question two to a 
question two code and have those, um, if you've got that kind of semi-structured um, uh, uh, arrangement or interview guide, then you may be interested to just at, at least initially gather all their responses to a certain question in one place. It's pretty likely that you would still go through and read those transcripts to code for the various topics of interest, but you at least could, if you had a committee meeting coming up and they said, what do people have to say about the community and the environment, for instance, and you know that people more or less answered that question in question four, you could open the question four code and look across that and kind of get a summary look at what people said in response to question four. This may not be the total finishing piece of your um, research, but it could be uh, uh, an interim look at what you've got and be a way that you can quickly gather together all of the things that were said in response to this question about um, community and environment. So multiple ways to approach coding and analysis. And Vivo doesn't care which way you do it. You can do uh, a combination of creating codes and also um, uh, change those coding structures as you go. And one of the most important features, I think, for demonstrating rigor and the strength of your analysis is to actually use what's called the code book in NVivo. And you might be familiar with that term from your own research, but the code book in NVivo is a very specific um, uh, Word document that's generated that will show you a list of all of these codes and the definitions or the descriptions of what belongs in them. By the way, I didn't mention, but should mention that there is hierarchy that you can create in a code as well, so that if you've got um, a top level code, like I have here with these plus signs beside them, you will see child codes or sub codes, we use those terms interchangeably, and all of these codes are examples of or types of this top level code. So really, really helpful to be able to um, kind of evolve your coding structure. You might start with a long list of codes that have no structure and then rearrange them so that they have some hierarchy. Or you may begin um, by having some top level codes and then adding some codes to them and so on. If I go to export my code book now, I can go to share and export and export code book. And I'm not going to do it now, but I will show you what it looks like. I already did it earlier. The code book from NVivo generates a Word document and you can actually see the name of the code, the description of what belongs in that code if you've entered that as you've created them, and then the number of files, in this case, that would be the number of different pieces of information in my project, and the number of references that have been coded to that code. So this is showing me that in the mixed attitude code, this is what we've coded that belongs in mixed attitude, where we have coded that from eight different files, and we've got four different, 44 different references from that. So that code book exported at a regular, um, regular times or periodically as you progress through your research becomes a very, very helpful documentation of how your coding structure and your research analysis has progressed. So you might start with a code book that has a long list of undifferent, un, um, non, no structure in them and vague descriptions. And towards the end of your project, you've got a code book that looks very robust. So I wanted to show you um, how the codes and code book could look, different ways of approaching coding, how to do some of these things. We'll cover a bit more in the demonstration session after this. The notes section, and I talked about memos and notes quite a bit yesterday, but in a similar kind of way, you can create notes or memos in NVivo that allow you to track your ideas and thoughts about your analysis as it's progressing. And you can link um, memos to certain items to track your thoughts about that specific item. 
So you might want to link memos to certain interviews, let's say, and that's where you capture your field notes about that interview or anything special about the interview that you would like other people in the team to know, or you're simply your own reflections of what of what Susan's interview was like, let's say, and how it was a little bit different from some of the other um, interviews, and you want to capture that as you're doing it. Similarly, you can link a memo to uh, a code. So as I'm beginning to gather my thoughts about certain things under the economy code, let's say, and I've got some ideas and even some quotes that are highly representative of some of the main uh, topics that we're seeing within this developing theme, I could link a memo to the economy code track my thoughts about that code, and then be able to export that, including some key quotes. So I'm not going to show you now how to create a memo, but I did actually um, create one link to the code for community change. And I have that memo exported here. And here's a little bit of the way my summary would begin. And also some of the key quotes that I captured for um, um, the illustration of what this topic is. So going back to what Jessica talked about and being able to make a claim from your own evidence, you're going to really need the excerpts or, or quotes from your data to justify why you think community change was one of the primary topics of discussion across your interviewees and some key quotes that are exemplar uh, exemplary um, excerpts of what people were talking about. One of the benefits of capturing these in en vivo as you're reading them is that you can then include that in the memo. If you're using um, en vivo for Windows, you can use this see also links feature and then export it as a key quote. You've got it as a Word document. As you begin to write and summarize your own results and you're in your discussion, you've got access to the quotes here and are able to easily um, look across them to be sure that you've chosen representative quotes, that kind of thing. So one other thing that I still wanted to show you, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday, is the ability to create queries inside NVivo. And queries are the ways that we ask questions or do further explanation, explorations of our data in NVivo. So there are built-in queries into the sample project. And if I go down to the query criteria, I can see that they've got a number of queries built in. And one of the queries that I think is really helpful and can be used at any stage of the research, even before you've done any coding potentially, is called the word frequency query. And this word frequency query is set to run just across all of the interviews, and it produces a list of the most frequently used words in the interviews. I use this kind of query, I look at the list and I start to think about things that um, are words that are being used quite a lot and ask myself, is this expected? Is this what I thought we would find in terms of what people were talking about? Maybe I didn't anticipate that they were going to talk about development and those kinds of things as much as they did. The visualization associated with a word frequency query is a word cloud. And a word cloud is a visual representation of frequency. So the words that are in the center, either bigger font or um, font that is of a contrasting color and so on, in the word cloud generated by Envivo, that represents frequency. So the most frequently used words are in the center and a different color of font or a different size of font and so on. This kind of visual representation can be helpful to help you think about whether or not you've explored certain topics well enough, and also can be used, um, different word clouds could be generated, let's say for different communities or different sets of data. And when you put those word clouds together, people can really see, oh, in this community, the most prominent words were development and fishing. And in this one, it's, um, uh, talking about community values and something else. So those word clouds can be really helpful in driving the interpretation. A leather, another uh, query that is very commonly used is, um, and often I use these in, in an iterative fashion back and forth, is a text search query. 
And in a text search query, we're looking for words or multiple words. Um, maybe they're of interest to us. Maybe we found some words that we want to explore from the word frequency query. And it looks for those words in and shows me where they show up in context. Again, I can tell NVivo where to look, set the data parameters, tell it to just look in the interviews or across all the data and so on. And this help can be helpful right away because I can get a sense of if I was looking for where people talked about policy or zones or permits, those kinds of things, I can see at a glance where that showed up a lot in the interviews. Um, so I can see that it was talked a lot of uh, 17 references to those words in Barbara's interview, but only one in Helen's interview and only a few in some of the other data sources. And then I can also click on the reference tab to see where those showed up in context. So if you're interested to find out a little bit more about how to do some of these things, then I invite you to um, jump into the um, NVivo demo after this and or look at the recording afterwards and uh, we'll take you through step by step. So Stacy, I think I'm just going to pause there, see if there's any questions for me to answer, or we're just going to hop off. I tried to answer them as we went the best I could. Um, and for some people, they want to get more in depth with NVivo. So I encourage them to go to your breakout session that's starting now. So we'll see everyone in the breakout. And I'm doing one on Satavi. So we'll, we'll see you soon. Bye. Okay. Thanks Thank so you. much. Bye, everyone.